going to talk about artificial intelligence, transhumanism, and other things that very few of the American people know much, if anything, about, then really a day doesn't go by much without a news story somewhere reporting some amazing breakthrough in artificial intelligence, otherwise known, of course, as AI. Many philosophers, futurists, and AI researchers have conjectured that human-level AI will be developed in the next 20 to 200 years. Some would say it has already been developed. It's behind closed black doors right now. I suggest that's a possibility. If these predictions are correct, it raises new and sinister and very dark issues related to our future in the age of intelligent machines. Intelligent machines. We've seen science fiction movies about these things. We've written about them. We've read about them in science fiction classic novels. It's all true. It's all happening. Science fiction is rapidly science fact. Artificial superintelligence is the name of the book. It's uh, subtitled A Futuristic Approach, and it directly addresses these issues and consolidates research aimed at making sure that emerging superintelligence is beneficial to humanity. A good concept, wouldn't you say? While specific predictions regarding the consequences of superintelligent AI vary from potential economic hardship to the complete extinction of all of us, many researchers agree that the issue is gigantic, and it's not going to go away. Dr. Roman V. Yapolsky, it's Yampolsky, Y-A-M-P-O-L-S-K-I, is... A, a brilliant member of the University of Louisville staff, and at Louisville he has uh, created a great deal of controversy with his forward thinking and his extraordinary uh, exponential, uh, I guess we could call it revelations about artificial intelligence and artificial superintelligence. A Futuristic Approach is the book on the table tonight. Uh, Dr. Yapolsky, welcome to the program, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Jeff. You're welcome. Uh, University of Louisville, not often thought about as a home of AI. Uh, in, in your work, Dr. Yampolsky, what about AI at Louisville? Is it, a big, is it a big issue there, or is it something that you have pioneered and kind of created under the umbrella of the university itself? Well, the university is very supportive of my research, but it is my my direction, and uh, I am a director of cybersecurity lab here, and I'm very interested in intersection of security and artificial intelligence. Uh, not too many people work in that area in general. Uh, not many computer scientists, surprisingly, a lot of philosophers, but uh, very right. few cybersecurity experts. You're right. You're a scientist in a field that we think of as intelligence, artificial intelligence. It's a a very subjective term in a way. I don't know how you define it. I don't know where it's going. Is it something that Dr. Yampolsky is already out of control? Some people say that. So the definition of superintelligence is any system which is more capable than all people in all domains. It's wow. better not just that one specific thing, like your calculator is better at math, but it's really better at everything. That's pretty I scary. I don't think we've got <laughs> to that point quite yet, but uh-huh. it might happen pretty soon, sooner than a lot of people suspect it will. Not 200 years. Unlikely. I would be surprised if it didn't happen in the next 20 what do you think's going on in what they call black ops uh, behind the closed doors with unlimited funding? Now, they've been at this a long time. I'm sure you have contacts who talk to you uh, privately. I don't want to know what they say to you. But really, what is your best guess, as much as you can divulge and disclose right now, about the extent of progress in the world of artificial intelligence, which can do, as you just said, everything? So, obviously, having a lot of computational resources helps. Having, as you said, almost unlimited resources helps a lot. Uh, Usually that means they are a few years ahead of where the public is kind of 
allowed to know what's going on. So if you think about something like NSA, uh -huh. having access to quantum computing technology, uh, you can probably guess that they're just a few years ahead of the rest of us. Well, at the rate of uh, research development, a few years can be a hell of a long time. All right, and it's a uh, first mover advantage. Whoever gets there first will have a lot of uh, dominance in that domain. Is there a race? It used to be an arms race. I guess there still is an arms race, a, a new one now, but is there an AI race? And if so, where are the centers of artificial intelligence research that make the most news or are the most important? So there are two types of competition. One is in military applications. So countries like U.S., China compete in cyber warfare, who better develops, you know, robots, intelligent hacking tools. And the second war is uh, commercial, Google versus Facebook, who is developing better machine learning algorithms, who can apply them best to commercialize, uh, you know, big data, private data. You know, my question would be, you mentioned Google and Facebook. I, I am uh, personally convinced, without any necessarily uh, rock-solid foundation, that they are working often hand-in-hand, uh, -hand, arm in arm with, with the military-industrial congressional media complex in this country. I don't think that you can separate those, uh, those particular entities completely, can we? Well, we saw some revelations from Snowden about government forcing some of those corporations to participate uh, through court orders. Right, right. I don't think there is desire to participate, but sometimes they have to provide certain information, like the case with Apple and unlocking the iPhone for FBI. Well, the funny thing about Apple is they had already cracked uh, iPhones and other Apple products for the NSA and the CIA apparently dozens of times in the past, and I, I still can't figure out what all the uh, the noise in the media was about because they have a record of doing that in the past. And ultimately, the CIA and the intelligence establishment took that phone and, and got it cracked by an, apparently an independent. All right, so always in the past it was a particular case. We need this iPhone unlocked, this particular crime. Whereas uh, what they wanted this time is a general backdoor, so anytime they want to go in, they can ah, go anywhere, anytime. Uh-huh, okay. All right, where are we uh, on the timeline, in your view? Now, we've talked about 20 to 200 years. Uh, in terms of really having to worry about artificial intelligence, is it beginning to show the dimensions of the potential that could create a true threat to humankind. Can you see that in your mind? I assume it's in the book. I haven't read it. Artificial Superintelligence, a Futuristic Approach is one of the most important books ever written on the subject. But where are we? How do you, in other words, do you, let me rephrase this. Do you ever wake up at night sweating from a nightmare or a bad dream saying, uh, in a dream, oh my God, it's over. They've taken over. They've surpassed humankind. They can recreate themselves. They can replicate themselves. We're toast. A lot of people do. I generally try to remain calm. It helps to think about things rationally, not panic. Uh, depends also on what type of harm you're talking about. We already see a lot of economical issues, technological unemployment. A lot oh, yeah. of people are replaced by machines. So that is happening today. Some of the more um, significant impact is still ahead of us. Where in artificial intelligence are we lacking? Is it in the emotional context? Do we want to teach machines to think through an emotional paradigm while they're making decisions and, and coming to conclusions? Or do we strictly want them to be uh, sterile in their approach? So there is research on teaching machines to simulate emotions, understand emotions. No one really knows how to implement basic things like make a machine feel pain or feel uh -huh. pleasure. So we still don't know how to make feelings happen. Uh, typically, rationality is a good thing, and we want to create rational machines, but it's important for them to have human common sense, to understand things we want and not uh, to sort of act like a genie where you wish for something, but the way Genie performs the wish is not exactly what you had in mind. So they have to be trained or, or constructed to have empathy, compassion, 
uh, use common sense and compassion, as I said, I think is a key word in this. I don't know how you would begin. I don't understand anything about writing uh, software, programming, how this is done. Uh, are we using traditional software programmers to work with AI, or is there a new paradigm, a new way to, to program supercomputers for superintelligence that might, on its own, result in some kind of new, uh, we'll call it an emotional filter for these machines to work through that would be something unique to them that we didn't even program them. You're right, there is a new paradigm. We're not trying to do it from scratch. We used to create expert systems where we would ask experts what to do and they would give us hundreds, thousands of rules to code into the program. Now we're trying to simulate how a human brain works, create an artificial network of neurons, a deep neural network, and train it on massive data sets. And amazingly, the results we're getting are very similar to what a human brain does, and in many cases, much better. In many cases, much better. How interesting. Maybe we'll have a, a really great president someday. Maybe it won't be human. Uh, how interesting. Better than the human brain. The human brain has faults. How would you identify some of the major faults of the human brain that might be surpassed in artificial intelligence? What, what can a machine do that would better its human counterparts? It's kind of a difficult question, but what do you have? Well, it's actually a very interesting area of research. We call it a cognitive bias, and this is pretty much anything where instead of being rational, you rely on either faulty data or some sort of shortcut. Uh-huh. Uh, quite frequently, people engage in that. Instead of making decisions based on data, they go with their feelings, with their loyalties, uh, biases, uh, something a machine could yes, be yes. trained not to do. You, you say could be trained not to do? Right. Ah, so that's your your bedrock in saying that they may someday surpass the human brain in terms of n neural networking and ultimately decision making. It wouldn't be messed with and interfered with by biases and other things that, that do get in the way and cause people to make poor decisions. It, very interesting. Well, there is a big push right now to make that software open source, to make it accessible to everyone so people can examine the code and see what's inside of it. So if any time we have concern about our ah. politicians maybe lying to us, maybe having somebody else's interest in mind, we don't really know until somebody, you know, leaks the data to us. Here we would be able to see exactly what the machine has Plant what uh, data it's trained on, and uh, we can kind of filter out problem AIs. Very interesting. And we're talking to Dr. Roman Yampolsky, University of Louisville, about artificial intelligence. His book is Artificial Superintelligence, a Futuristic Approach. Uh, it's really a contemporary approach, too. Okay, so this is very interesting. It used to be, in the beginning when AI was worked on and they were attempting to program computers to duplicate or replicate or simulate the human mind, that they would feed into it and program into it hundreds of thousands perhaps of, uh, of pieces of data to make the machine act human. Now they're taking a whole new approach and trying to duplicate and replicate how the human brain works. That's fascinating. Who's, who's pushing that, and where did that brilliance come? This is a, a field of sheer genius. Where did that come from? Uh, it's neuroscience. So people who study how human brain works finally got enough progress through, you know, better scanning equipment to have very good theories about at least portions of a brain. We still don't have complete understanding. Right. We can simulate a single neuron, a small network of those, and uh, companies like DeepMind, which was acquired by Google, are uh, trying yeah. to implement those algorithms and getting very solid results with them. Google, uh, the whole field is, is something that gives me a cause and pause for concern. Google especially has been involved on the cutting edge in genetics, which has worried me uh, for years. Bill Gates is involved with a lot of genetic manipulations and vaccines, uh, not necessarily going in the direction that I think most of us would want. The idea of artificial intelligence 
being in the wrong hands. And I, I use the term advisedly, but there are wrong hands out there. Uh, open source is, is looked at as a protection device, but I can't imagine, Dr. Yampolsky, that the military would give up to open source something that it considers vital to its defense and offensive protocols. You're right. Military is not participating in those programs. Uh -huh. Those are typically people in Silicon Valley who want uh, to share their technology with humanity. Okay. Uh, I, I like this idea, but I also worry. Now, let's go back to robots for just a minute. Uh, it is said that most fast food restaurants, if you can call them restaurants at all, will be uh, roboticized fairly soon. The minimum wage jobs are obviously going to be uh, done away with. Robots will be making the food, serving it, putting it up for pickup. Uh, the human factor will, is going to become more and more minimum. At the part of the wage and earning spectrum that we can't really afford to lose, uh, but we're going to. When do you see the machine beginning to make such a mark on the labor market in this country that it'll be a problem? That's coming. How, how many years do we have? So we already have the technology. Technology is developed. It's a question of uh, price point. When is it more efficient to have a robot do it instead of a minimum wage employee? And with the recent developments in changing what the minimum wage is, yeah, fifteen dollars an hour, yeah, becoming a lot more uh, affordable to to deal with robots. Well, at fifteen dollars an hour in California and other states, just talk about making New it York national. Just passed it, right. New York, so, that's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so we're... we're yeah, that would push it forward significantly. Okay, this is answering my question. Uh, the price point now becomes approachable, reachable, maybe even past. Uh, you know how it is when they bring something out new into the marketplace. It's expensive in the beginning, and then five years later tune in, and it's, it's 20, 25, 30% of what it used to cost. That's just the way it works. So we're headed toward astonishing revelations here now where do you where do you expect to see this first and and perhaps most obvious in terms of the, the general public dr yampolsky where will we see it uh fast food restaurants we already have uh self-checkout in uh big big box department stores home depot like lowe's and things uh it's moving in that direction nobody can count change anymore for god's sakes so what we're looking at here is big changes. How soon? Really? Five years? I, I, Less? I think the next big uh, change would be self-driving cars. We're going to see it with commercial drivers first, then Uber, taxis, and eventually you're not going to have drivers, period. None at all. And that, that may, it's that, just yeah. unsafe. It's unsafe to have a human driving a car. A machine controlled by AI is much safer. It can communicate with other machines, it doesn't get drunk, it doesn't get sleepy, it doesn't get tired. There are quite a few advantages to to an automated driver. This has always intrigued me because in the United States, I don't know if you even know this, but 45,000 Americans a year, men, women, and children, die on America's highways and roadways. I almost did a year ago. I'm lucky to be here. Nobody talks about this. 45,000 right. people a year. I use it as an example of technology, which if it was proposed today, somebody said, you know, we had no cars. Somebody said, hey, let's have cars, but it's 50,000 people in U.S. who will die. It would never get approved. You're right. You're totally but right. But with other technologies, we kind of go, well, oh, it's grandfathered in, so we can... Okay, now, uh, Google is running driverless cars. Other people are, too. Are they at this point in time, viable? They must they be. Are they are very good already. They uh -huh. perform beautifully. My concern is that they can be hacked, and that's very dangerous. Ah, of course. So now that would... can take control of your car, maybe multiple cars. If it's a terrorist network, that could create significant problems. I think you're understating that one. That could create a, a massive problem. Uh, Kidnap, think of kidnapping, uh, automobile murder. Uh, we already have auto sides in this country. People decide to kill themselves and, and take others with them. This is something that's not talked about either. 
But we are very close to having a, a very competent self-driving automobile right now. Yes? We have them already. They're being tested right now. Okay. Are you contacted much, Dr. Yampolsky, by the military at this point? Are you? I don't want you to disclose anything. I don't mean to pry, but the military is always involved with universities. That's where much of their research is done. Are you seeing that at the university level very often? Well, typically most funding for AI research comes from the military. Maybe not me specifically, but in general, that's the main funder of such research. And not surprisingly, a lot of development goes into military robots, drones, uh, automated weapons. Right. Okay. We'll talk more about that aspect uh, in just a few minutes with Dr. Roman Yampolsky as we continue a fascinating conversation. Stand by. 